Steve and Buzz, when, when we put our heads together and come up with ideas that we think not only would be interesting to our viewers, um, but have, have some impact and are consequential, you, you guys threw this idea out about fine tuning and the significance of it. So I, I wanna find out, like Buzz, let's start with you, your perspective as to what's the, the, the point of the conversation? Why is this a significant dialogue to have? Yeah. Well, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the most provocative discoveries in science uh, is the fact that the, the fundamental constants that define the universe have to assume uh, exacting values. In some cases, those, that exactness is, is beyond perception. It's just a, ex, you know, an exquisite fine tuning of the fundamental constants of nature. And it's, it's uh, an observation that I think demands an explanation. Uh, unlike other scientific discoveries. And, and of course, when you start thinking about what types of explanations can account for that fine tuning, you get into some very interesting metaphysical terrain that I, and, and I think if legitimately you could argue that that fine tuning suggests that the universe actually is fit for a purpose. And if that's the case, then it must emanate from a mind. And so from a, a Christian worldview perspective, fine tuning is one of those features of the universe that really provides support for um, for the, a theistic worldview. Steve, I, I imagine you don't fully agree with with Fuzz, yet you thought that this was worthy. I agree of the with it more than you think. Yeah, oh, I agree okay. With it more than you think, oh, oh, and not, not that I think that it, it demands a teleological explanation. I think that it demands an accounting for. Um, okay. It is a metaphysical question: why we can apprehend the universe. Um, this is something that man has always strived to, to put his place in the universe and why are we here? Why, why are the conditions the way they are that we have sentient beings that can look upon the universe and say, hey, look, we, uh, we, we, we want to observe the universe. We want to understand the universe. We want to understand the laws of physics. You know, uh, Fuzz takes it as, you know, there's some kind of design as some kind of um, you know, agent that had intentional states that designed the universe. I obviously as a um, agnostic do not believe that, but uh, as I think that atheists take the not fine tuning argument, not as seriously enough because they too need to have an accounting. As, as Fuss said, that's the word to be used. What is the accounting for why we are here and why these, these seemingly strange laws of physics that kind of make no sense if you really think about it, why things are the way they are and why the numbers are the way they are and why they have to be so specific for life to occur for us to exist. And so Hugh, um, with fine tuning, you know, obviously most of us understand what that means, but it's like, I don't know if there's a difference in what, how you would define it and how Paul would define it as far as like with, with uh, astronomical fine tuning. What, is, what do you mean by that? Or from a Christian perspective, not just you, but from a Christian perspective. Yeah, I think our generation tends to presume that uh, fine tuning and the anthropic principle is something that the astrophysicists invented in the, the late 20th century. But in fact, it dates all the way back to Socrates. You know, this is something that humans have always been interested in and recognize that this needs uh, some kind of metaphysical answer. So it's not the new phenomena that you often see in the books. And I do appreciate that Paul's brought that out in some of his books, because it's so easy for us to kind of take on this uh, hubris that, hey, we're the ones that came up with it, when in fact it's been around for a long, long time. So when you say fine tuning though, um, Hugh, are you, I've heard the term like Goldilocks, but that's like more about the planet. So are, are you saying, because I've heard you say something about if there was like a dime's width of, of more mass in the universe, it all wouldn't work. So are you saying that everything has to be exactly jot and tittle in the entire universe, how, how it is? Well, it depends a bit on how you define the anthropic principle. I mean, what you see in some scientific papers is, okay, to what degree do we have to fine tune the physics, uh, fine tune the different characteristics of the universe, our galaxy and our planet uh, to make possible the existence of a microbe? Uh, that's a little bit different than what's needed to make possible for the existence of human beings or the functional equivalent. And I think that's a big question. Uh, does the evidence for fine tuning increase as we go from, say, the simplest bacterium up to a simple animal, up to human beings, up to humans, uh, where we have a high population and a high technology civilization. And Paul, would you agree or disagree with that, that 
definition or a description of fine tuning? Well, that? well let me, Jack, if I could just put my own spin. Uh, when I'm trying to talk about it, you know, what does fine tuning mean? We think of tuning a radio or something. And so let's go with that analogy. Imagine uh, you didn't like the universe as it is. You wanted to change a few things and you had like a designer machine in front of you with with knobs on and you can twiddle the knobs and change things. So twiddle this knob and you make all electrons a bit heavier. Twiddle that knob, you make gravity a bit stronger and so on. Uh, Then physicists and cosmologists have sat down, worked out how many knobs on this uh, machine. These are, we call them undetermined parameters, but let's just call them knobs. Uh, And there's 30 something. uh, And uh, what you find if you do the experiment, and I'm talking now about a mathematical experiment, not the real thing, we don't have this designer machine yet, uh, but you can say, well, if we, if all else is equal, we leave everything unchanged and say, make the weak nuclear force a bit weaker, does it make any difference? And what you find is that for a lot of those knob settings, it doesn't make too much difference, but some of them uh, seem to be very sensitive. And when we talk about fine tuning, what we really mean is that if you had a value uh, really not a lot different from what nature seems to have chosen, uh, it would wreck the chances of any life in the universe would have literally lethal consequences as you twiddled those knobs on the machine. Um, Now, uh, the question, uh, part part of the problem of this analysis is that I don't think any scientist believes that all of these knobs really are uh, are equal. Uh, That is to say, uh, we, we think the hope is, as physics becomes unified, that we'll, we'll find that if you lift the face off this machine inside, they're connected together. Uh, and the, the total number of parameters would be much smaller. And it's very easy to give examples, but I'm limited to four minutes, I know. Uh, but if you can ask me another question, you give us an example. Uh, and then I can tell you why, uh, you know, tuning this knob may not be the right one to tune in, uh, in a few years' time when we have a deeper theory. But that, so that's the sort of general idea. And I don't think there's really any doubt about the fact that the universe does look like it's rigged in favor of life. And, uh, and we, do, we do use the term Goldilocks for universes. I did, at least, uh, in a book called The Goldilocks Enigma. And I'm referring to the whole universe and not just to our planet, which is a sort of separate set of issues. I'm going to stop talking there, otherwise I should get carried away. 